And here, another touch of nature's magic. Here in the desert, a sea called Sultan Sea. Landlocked, rich in beauty and allure, 35 miles long, 10 to 16 miles wide, its maximum depth, 40 feet. The Sultan Sea, sportsman's paradise, the new recreational capital of the world, attracting tremendous numbers of water skiers and boaters, and just plain people all the year round. Well, I was born here in Indio, so they took me home to the Salton Sea. As often as possible, we would go down and go swimming. I learned how to swim in the Salton Sea. It was our beach. There were hundreds of thousands of people that visited the Salton Sea, more than Yosemite National Park. You hear stories about not being able to move on Highway 111 because of all the people that were coming down. It was just packed. Salton City, they were just bringing busloads of people down there. People water skiing and lots of sailboats and boat races. As a boy, my family actually went out to the Salton Sea. We used to fish there. In the early 60s, that was a wonderful place to go, place to meet people, place to bring people. Probably uh, one of the high points of my life, we were in a 60 Chevy. We were listening to 60s music. We're in the area of maybe Bombay Beach, and the sun was just coming up. And I looked over, and there were tens of thousands of birds coming off the sea. To see the sunrise and see the birds and the music and open air convertible, I think, you know what? This is as good as it gets. This is heaven. This is my place. I will be here the rest of my life. Back in the 60s, we had more visitors than Yosemite. The vast Salton Sea. Here is where you can find the good life in the sun. What the hell happened here? Hello? Hello? This was all houses and businesses. This is like 1968. And I used to sit on the rocks right here and sing Puff the Magic Dragon, because I was six. All of this white bit right here between the bushes, that was all the marina. The boat ramp was right over there between those two poles. This is underwater, except it's not. People don't know where we are. We're a long ways from Sacramento. And that's where the money comes from. We're represented by half a congressman. And so we've got a heck of a battle in front of us. Just incredible how fast the sea is going down. The Salton Sea is predicted to shrink dramatically. In the past six months to a year, there has been a much more dramatic decline in the water level than I've ever seen at any time. As the shorelines retreat to new lows, as more lake bed is exposed, more dust in the air, that can create a, a public health hazard, a real problem, and a costly one. Millions of people are within air quality range of this basin, and the air quality is dropping quickly, so people are getting sicker and sicker. The California Department of Health tells me here in Imperial County, children go to the hospital for asthma at a rate two to three times higher than anywhere else in the state. If nothing is done, there will be an ecological disaster there. This is going to affect everything from below the border of Mexico to Phoenix to Los Angeles. A study by the Pacific Institute estimates damages of almost $30 billion if we continue to do nothing. There's going to be a problem at the Salton Sea. Whether the state of California is going to step up and pay for solving that problem 
or the people of the Imperial and Coachella and Mexicali Valleys are going to pay those costs. Somebody's going to pay. Seeing the salt and sea for the first time is really an amazing experience. If you don't know what to look for, it's completely unexpected and it's stunningly beautiful, but also very quiet, very remote. Located 150 miles southeast of Los Angeles, the Salton Sea covers 350 square miles and sits 236 feet below sea level. The Salton Sea is at the heart of the Imperial and Coachella Valleys and is only 30 miles from Palm Springs and 15 miles from the world-famous Coachella Music Festival. For the Coachella Valley, tourism is our biggest business, way over a billion dollars a year in tourism. Some people fly over the area, they come in, they're visitors, and they see this large body of water and they don't even know what the heck it is. The Salton Sea is still the largest lake in the state of California. And to put that in perspective, you can fit 13 Manhattans inside the Salton Sea. It's a beautiful place to live when there's water. The water level's gone down quite a bit. A lot of these docks are just up in the air. These were full of water and boatable to their docks, I'd say seven or eight years ago. All of that beach was underwater, so you could take a boat and pull up to those houses. The sea that we see out there now started in the 1850s. Early surveyors that were looking for a southern route for the railroad, they came across the valley and realized the soil was excellent for growing crops, and if they could just get water to it, it would be a, a desert oasis. They discovered that because we're all below sea level, water would run out downhill if they could divert it at the Colorado River. One of those early surveyors was a man named Charles Rockwood. He arrived in Southern California in the late 1800s and saw great potential in bringing water to the desert to irrigate it and create a huge swath of fertile land that could be farmed. Charles Rockwood was here as a pioneer in the desert. He was a dreamer. He, he was intuitive. He got it. He's looking at this dirt in the middle of the desert, and he says, God, if only there was water. And then he looks over the horizon and says, oh, wait, there's a big giant river there. Let's just bring it over here. Rockwood's dream was to build a canal that started at the Colorado River, then ran south into Mexico, and then back up into California. But in the financial panic of 1893, the Colorado Irrigation Company he worked for went bankrupt. Intent on pursuing his dream, Rockwood started his own company to develop and build the canal. He started the California Development Company. He approached dozens of investors, but most found his plans laughable, reminding him it would be impossible for anyone to live in the heat of the California desert, let alone build a canal in those conditions. That's when George Chaffee arrived. An experienced engineer, he had built irrigation systems in Australia, where the heat was similar to the California desert, and he knew it could be done. Seeing the same potential, Chaffee offered Rockwood $150,000 to finance the canal, under the condition that he now be named president and chief engineer of the California Development Company. Rockwood despised the idea that someone else would control his company, but he had no choice. Out of money, and out of time, Rockwood agreed and signed the contract. Rockwood and Chaffee saw the ramifications of doing this because it was important. I don't think it was just about the money. It was about making an accomplishment, making a difference, making a mark on the world while he was still here. 
That set into motion a series of events that would end in one of the greatest engineering disasters of modern American history. In 1900, Rockwood's dream finally became a reality. The California Development Company dug the canal from the Colorado River. They called it the Alamo Canal. With Chaffee's money, they cut their first intake into the Colorado River at a place called Pilot Knob, and water was officially on its way to the desert. It was just below Yuma. It went 50 miles into Mexico and then came back across the border. It was the late 1800s, and there weren't a lot of excavators around. It was a huge engineering challenge. Water arrived in the Imperial Valley in 1901, and that was the earliest uh, waterway into what would become the Imperial Valley. They got the water where it needed to go, and they brought more people out here, the pioneers, because there was nothing here until they just made it out of dust, really fertile dust. The farmers quickly arrived to exploit the land. Nearly everything they planted grew incredibly well, as the soil was more fertile than anybody predicted. Chaffee, seeing financial opportunity, created the Imperial Land Company to advertise to settlers and renamed the area the Imperial Valley. The California Development Company was one of the original promoters of development in the Imperial Valley. And there was a land rush because there was a tremendous reclamation effort in this part of California. Settlers started moving into the valley, purchasing land, and started to farm. And it was a tremendous success for the farmers. As the valley began to grow, the shares of the California Development Company increased dramatically in value. Many of the smaller shareholders began to sell their stakes for profit, and Rockwood took advantage. He slowly bought up as many shares as he could, and regained majority ownership of his company. And his first order of business was to push out George Chaffee and take back control. This would prove to be a fateful mistake. As soon as he did, he faced another problem, silt. The Colorado River is very heavily silt loaded. They had a silt problem in, in the drains and the canals. And over time, that would plug up, and you wouldn't be able to get enough irrigation water into the valley. They had all this great land. People were coming to farm, and they just didn't engineer it correctly. So we, you have primo soil, some of the best soil in the world that's there. So the farmers recognized that, and that's what they were losing. In 1905, there were uh, perhaps 10,000 residents here farming. In 110 degree heat, farmers grew irate as their water slowed to a trickle and their crops began to die. But the California Development Company estimated it would take more than a year to dredge the canals, remove the silt, and get the water flowing again. As the farmers ran out of water, they refused to pay the California Development Company, which was now near bankruptcy. And with pressure mounting, Rockwood had to find a solution, and quickly. In early 1905, Rockwood contacted E.H. Harriman, the head of the Southern Pacific Railroad. Harriman, against the advice of his advisors, offered Rockwood a $200,000 loan to fix the canals, but with the stipulation that the Southern Pacific Railroad would now take controlling interest in the California Development Company. Again, Rockwood detested the idea of giving up a part of his company but he reluctantly accepted and quickly used the new funds to devise a solution. So one of the things they did was cut this new intake off the Colorado River. Four miles south of the California border, his men cut a new intake directly off the shores of the Colorado River to bypass the parts of the canal that had become clogged with silt. But Rockwood's plan would be one of the most catastrophic engineering decisions ever made. The Colorado River had regular flooding events. Headgate construction to control the flow of water from the new intake took nearly a year to get approval from the Mexican government. And by that time, Rockwood had a much more serious problem. The Gila River, the Colorado River were just really running full. An unexpected flood slammed into the valley in the spring of 1905, and Rockwood was caught totally off guard. They thought in January that it wasn't gonna flood. Lo and behold, there was a surprise flood. The Colorado River quickly broke through the intake, and a wave of water rushed into the Imperial Valley. 
Rockwood and his engineers struggle to close the breach with makeshift pilings, brush, and sandbags across what was a 60-foot gap. Just as they thought they had succeeded, another flood hit the river and broke through again. In 1905, the canal breached. The breach grew from 60 feet to 150 feet, nearly tripling in size. The entire contents of the Colorado River spilled into the Imperial Valley. Initially, the surveyors and all their estimators experts, they had plans for a standard water flow, but nothing like uh, the year of 04 and 05, when that water at flood stage overtopped some of the wooden and earthen dams that they had. It started inundating the valley. The flood waters rushed into the lowest point in the desert, a place called the Salton Sink. Luckily, the flood started to recede in late 1905, giving Rockwood and his men a short reprieve and sparing the residents of the Imperial Valley further devastation. But Rockwood knew there were only a few months until the next flooding season arrived, and he needed a solution fast. The Mexican government finally approved Rockwood's headgate structure, and he was sure this would solve the problem. In early 1906, construction began, but Rockwood's plans again proved a bit too ambitious. To complete the repairs, he still desperately needed a dredge that was located in San Francisco. But before it could be sent, he faced yet another disaster. the Great San Francisco Earthquake of 1906. Southern Pacific's headquarters in San Francisco was engulfed in flames, and the dredge wouldn't arrive for another year. Without the dredge, Rockwood felt it was impossible to complete the repairs. Exhausted and defeated, he resigned from the California Development Company the following day on April 19, 1906. The Southern Pacific Railroad took over. Southern Pacific Railroad they wanted it to come to fruition. They realized it was kind of a disaster, and they realized if it was solved, what this place could be. They finished construction in the fall of 1906, and almost as soon as they did, another flood overtook the Colorado River. The headgate collapsed almost immediately under the stress of the water. E.H. Harriman and his railroad were back to square one. The breach, once a 150-foot gap, was now 2,700 feet wide. And with no headgate to control the water, it flowed straight into the Imperial Valley. The scale of the flood was beyond what anyone had imagined, and almost biblical in proportion. The residents and farmers stood by helplessly as their town and fields were submerged and destroyed. A lot of the land that had been developed was covered with water. And so the farmers just had to walk away from, from their, their ground that was flooded. By this point, Southern Pacific had spent nearly $1 million trying to stop the flood with no success. Their tracks were quickly being swallowed up by the floodwaters, and with them, the risk of losing a major passenger rail line to Los Angeles. The residents of the valley had lost nearly everything. Desperate, E.H. Harriman realized that this was a problem too large to fix on his own. The Southern Pacific Railroad appealed directly to Theodore Roosevelt. Harriman sent Roosevelt a telegram. The president's response was simple. He ordered Harriman to fix the problem immediately. Roosevelt sent one back, use all resources available to do it. Roosevelt promised him that the government would reimburse Southern Pacific for the expense of doing so. The president more or less told him that his job was to stop the flow into the valley. He wasn't too happy about it, but, you know, when the president tells you to do something, you usually, you usually do it. With that assurance, Harriman's efforts to stop the flood began the very same day he received the president's response. He devised a plan. They built a trestle across the Colorado River, and they had hundreds of cars full of this rock. They just dumped train loads and train loads of stuff trying to stop it. That's basically all Southern Pacific did. Bring the Sierra Nevadas here and just dump them into this breach. 
locomotives came from as far as 480 miles away and dumped 2,057 carloads of rock, 221 carloads of gravel, and 203 carloads of clay into the breach. After must have been a year and a half plus of intensive efforts, it finally filled it up. On January 27, 1907, nearly two years after the flooding began, the breach was finally closed. What was left behind was a body of water in the middle of the desert, 30 miles long and 15 miles wide, that they called the Salton Sea. This was probably eight months ago, this line right here. And the shallower it gets, the faster it goes down. There are many issues that come together at the Salton Sea. That's what makes it particularly complicated. There's less water flowing into the Salton Sea. At the same time, it's growing more saline. It was basically created by people, and now it is deteriorating. In 1912, the Imperial Irrigation District bought the California Development Company out of bankruptcy. They began to control the water distribution throughout the Imperial Valley, and still do to this day. Much of the Imperial Valley receives power and water from the Imperial Irrigation District, or IID. So the IID is the largest controller of water of the end of the Colorado River. And they support many, many farms that are in the region. For some time, it was growing close to half of the nation's winter vegetables in this region. The Salton Sea is sustained almost entirely by runoff from the farms and fields of the Imperial Valley. The hydrology of the Colorado River simply won't sustain a sea the size that it is today. In 2003, everyone knew we weren't going to have enough water to continue using it the way that we have been for many years. So we needed to find ways to uh, be more resourceful and, and cut back on our water uses. The biggest user of Colorado River water, not just in the state of California, but on the system as a whole, is the Imperial Irrigation District. So in 2003, they signed an agreement called the Quantification Settlement Agreement, which was a way to bring California down to its normal year entitlement of Colorado River water. Much of the water that's coming into the Imperial Valley is now transferred to the coast of California to the cities that are growing rapidly. What this is doing is creating significantly less acres farmed in the region, and it means the water that would be running off from the farms is no longer going into the Salton Sea. So as the sea started to recede, a wind would blow and it looked like something was on fire. It was a white smoke. People downwind from those, my daughter's one of them, on a dusty day where we had a northwest wind where the Salton Sea Playa dust came into our area. You know, she'd have to stay inside and use her breathing treatments and everything else. The wind is about 25 miles an hour right now, which is normal. It's already a very dusty area. Imperial Valley, Coachella Valley already failed to meet state and federal air quality standards. And it's particularly bad for vulnerable populations, right? Kids, uh, people with respiratory problems, asthma, the elderly really can be affected by this most dramatically, but many people can be affected by this beyond those populations. And there's been an increase in the incidence of asthma and respiratory problems in the Imperial and Coachella Valleys already because of dust. So welcome to Desert Shores, California. This is the northernmost town in the west shores of the Salton Sea. It's some of the nicer homes and the most homes on a waterfront property. I moved out to the Salton Sea uh, around 2014. We founded the Eco Media Compass, a voice for the Salton Sea in the political realm. We became a go-to for knowledge, information, and ideas on how to restore the Salton Sea. In many cases, the residents weren't able to make it to Sacramento, and we have been able to organize their voices in a way that could be heard unlike before. Ultimately, I became the mayor of the West Shores, so Salton City, Vista Del Mar, Salton Sea Beach, and Desert Shores for two terms. 25 years ago, my mom passed away from a lung disease. She wasn't living at the Salton Sea, but I was able to see firsthand what people go through and how hard they suffer if their lungs and their breathing are compromised. And the, one of the main reasons that I came out here and did this work is because I don't want to see other people have to go through that.
I was born here in the Coachella Valley. At least from what I could remember, um, most of my childhood was me being sick. Um, my parents started noticing, like, hey, she's out of breath, she's turning blue, let's take her to the hospital. They diagnosed me with uh, asthma at six months old. I'm already 27, so I've been living with asthma pretty much my whole life. All the statistics show that the rate of asthma for young children here in the Valley is higher than anywhere else. We knew what the Salton Sea was. We would ask questions. I mean, why would there be a big lake and you can't go and enjoy the water? My parents always used the same answer. Like, no, the water's really dirty. You know, it's not healthy. But it was always there. I mean, you're driving by and you see a big lake. And as a child, you want to stop by. For some reason, people had a bad connotation about the sea. Oh, it's a sewer. But that's not true. The sea is uh, one of the cleanest bodies of water in California. It's never really been closed for pollution. Actually, we're safer here than the Pacific Ocean. The water quality isn't that bad. It's relatively low in pesticides and herbicides. It's high in nutrients, and it's high in suspended solids. There hadn't been one day in the history of the Salton Sea when it was close to contact swimming. Seeing the Salton Sea for the first time, we wondered what had happened to this place. It was very quiet, very hot, very abandoned. We all had so many questions and wanted to find the answers. Well, the Salton Sea, once it was formed, people came down to just look at it. The first one really down there, I guess, was Captain Davis. A former sailor from the East Coast, Captain Davis left his ship and traveled across the United States looking for a new adventure. He eventually arrived in the Imperial Valley and made a home atop a volcanic mountain at its southern end. He had started his new life there when the floodwaters of 1906 surrounded his home, suddenly making it an island. Mullet Island got its name because when the sea flooded, mullet fish were washed in. So there's a tremendous amount of fish in the Salton Sea, and they hung out around Mullet Island. Davis saw opportunity and converted his home into a boat landing, cafe, and dance hall for the nearby community. And since it was located on top of a volcano, he named it Hell's Kitchen. Quite a party area down there. He sold all kinds of interesting things there. He was uh, feeding mullet fish and selling those fish, even took them up to Los Angeles to sell and kept it going there for about 25 years. Next came a string of men enchanted by the sea who believed their fortune lied on its shores. The first was a man named Gus Eilers, who arrived in 1926, hoping he had found his path to success. Grandpa came down here and he just said, something wonderful is going to happen here. This dream for this community on this beautiful, sparkling body of water. They went down there, they bought the property. There was nothing there at the time, but he built piers out there, one after another. 4,400 acres worth of plans laying out the streets. Eilers built an Egyptian-themed resort called Date Palm Beach. But Eilers' dream crashed along with the stock market in 1929. Still, he didn't give up. In 1932, he imported two cottages from Los Angeles and built two piers for speedboats. His dream began to take flight as people arrived to boat and swim. There would be campers, uh, boats, people sunbathing. I mean, it, it would almost be like uh, Huntington Beach. It became real popular during World War II. By the early 40s, Eilers Resort was filled with soldiers on leave, up to 500 per day. There were so many servicemen training here at the time. There was a Navy base on the Salton Sea itself. That's where they had their R&R. &R. People were coming down and dancing and partying. It wasn't really crowded. There's so much space that water skiing was real good. On Lake Havasu, it was a mad world. That's why we liked the Salton Sea, because there was space. The sheriff would be out there patrolling. The game warden would be out there patrolling. The Coast Guard would be out there patrolling. The US Navy. Eilers eventually sold his resort to investor C. Roy Hunter, who quickly learned the Salton Sea was as unpredictable as it was beautiful. Then, of course, the Salton Sea did begin to rise in the late 40s. The shores of the sea started to quickly rise as runoff waters from the farms in the area increased 
and the sea flooded many resorts. The shoreline changed, and that changed the landscape and what could be done down there. Houses were flooded, farmland was washed away. The shoreline has been variable since 1907. Completely variable. Well, I was playing around in the mud along the edge of the sea. At Fish and Game, California Fish and Game, they planted the sea with various types of fish. In the 1950s, the California State Department of Fish and Game uh, was directed to go to the Sea of Cortez and basically capture anything that they could, any type of creature that was in the Sea of Cortez, because the climatic conditions and salinity of the water at the time was very much like the Sea of Cortez. They netted over 200 different types. They had shark, tortuava, shrimp, lobster. Without specific scientific analysis, just threw stuff in there to see what would survive. And some fish really thrived. There was three species that took over. There was a fish called a croaker, another called sargo, another one called corvina, and the croakers were the food source for the corvina. So you had lots of fishermen down there all the time fishing for the corvina. There was all kinds of fish in the sea, and they took off rapidly, and it was a very important fishery. This is where we came fishing. So this was about launch, and uh, paid our fees here, and then we, then we went out. At this point, you could see 50 to 100 boats out there fishing. This area had the most fish than any body of water in the state of California. Fishermen came from all over. I mean, thousands of fishermen were fish on the Salton Sea because you could catch fish that were 10, 12, 15 pounds in size, and they were excellent to eat. They were just like white sea bass. And I can remember a cousin of mine used to go out there and fish with a uh, thin, thin Rapala lure and uh, catch trophy-sized corvina. With the fish population growing, another wave of investors arrived looking for financial opportunity. People wanted to live down at the Salton Sea, so they developed the properties where the streets were already laid out in North Shore. You saw some developments along Salton City area, Palm Bay Beach, Nyland, and some of those other areas. And then some real estate folks got excited about making a new desert Riviera on the Salton Sea. looking at a remarkable idea, an idea that has intrigued and attracted and literally thrilled thousands upon thousands of men, women, and children. And you, my friends, are about to witness this idea become a reality, for this is the story of the miracle sea in the desert, the Salton Sea. I was in the valley when that was happening, you know, and we drove around there so we could see that they were developing the roads and all the infrastructures, everything. During the 50s and 60s, lots of people were coming down to the sea. Of course, a lot of the people that were here during World War II, a lot of them came back and discovered this wonderful place. The Bombay Beach started as a blue-collar weekend getaway. The first time that I, I came down here, my grandparents had bought a place and they brought us down here, and super fun. Everybody just had fun. I worked at the senior center for many years, so I had seniors telling me that they remembered, you know, they went down there in a bus and they bought pieces of land down there. It was just a great hope. More than $22 million have been spent for paved streets through county specifications and utilities, a whole new outlet for the crowded millions in big cities. You can enjoy your life more fully, both mentally and physically, at the Salton Riviera. It became a real estate speculator's dream. And they began buying up large tracts of property and selling them up with amazing marketing campaigns, calling it the Salton Sea Riviera. Everybody was so excited. They had a big party. They wined them and dined them and sold them a piece of property. A lot of excitement. You know, they thought it was going to be something really special, something to get in at the very start. In the late 50s, the big resurgence came when Trav Rogers and Ray Ryan teamed up and bought the property that became the North Shore Beach and Yacht Club. It was just a real party place when they opened up the uh, North Shore Beach and Yacht Club. They had everything from fishing and water skiing to the gentleman's club on the upper floor. The Los Angeles newspapers were saying, go to the Salton Sea, and people came. 
Well, by the 1960s, it was a popular location. People were going there to water ski, to play golf, to visit the yacht club. It became immensely popular. People would come out here and go to concerts and go to casinos and yacht clubs, and it was a very ritzy, fun place to be. The Hollywood people came. And they brought in all these stars. Marilyn Monroe, the Beach Boys. Desi and Lucy, Frank Sinatra, the Rack Pack, all of them were down there. In no other place in the world can you enjoy the unique advantages of North Shore Beach and Yacht Club. People would just pull up in their boats and go in and have drinks and dinner and shrimp cocktail with Frank Sinatra. It's pretty cool. It was vibrant. It was alive. There was people everywhere. We were launching 15 and 20 foot boats up here, and we never even had to think about hitting bottom or anything. There was no thought about what would slowly be happening to the sea. It was all about what a great place it was to recreate. This is the future coming to life before your eyes. Here is the great marina, designed and constructed to give enjoyment to thousands for generations to come. Built by man for the enjoyment of man. This is the future today. They tried to push the developments several times. It never worked out. People just lost interest. There were three different companies that came in and tried to do it. They oversold, they overcharged, and you had to spend lots and lots of money to bring in your water and your power and electric, and no one did. People lost money. It was, it was a real estate scandal. It was a scam. Then things just sort of, you know, stopped. This is a KICO weather bulletin. The Weather Service has issued storm and flash flood warnings. Remember, gang, flash floods may be hazardous to your health. And now back to more country music at KICO. Hurricane Kathleen came along in the 70s. It devastated the valley. It really filled the sea up. The sea rose. It's very flat. The topography is very flat. So a small rise in sea, sea elevation covered a large area. The entire level of the sea, which I believe was 371 square miles at the time, the entire level of the sea went up 11 inches. I joined the NDO Fire Department in 1973. I was on duty that day. And the flooding was so tremendous, everything was disabled except one 100-foot aerial, simply because it had about, the engine was about six or seven feet off the ground, and that was the only thing we could drive around in. They, they claimed that was a 500-year flood. Myself and anybody else we, we could get on the truck, we were going street by street and uh, literally tying ropes to ourselves. And uh, so it was tie it to the truck, go out and get these people, pull them in, and go to the next one. The rain gauge at the 2,000 foot level straight up here behind uh, Indian Wells overflowed at uh, 22 and a half inches. And there were many homes damaged because the water rose and uh, flooded the home. In our feed lot alone, we lost 19 head of cattle that drowned. The water was too deep in the pens. All of our crops were ruined. Uh, so it was devastating. Washed out canals, washed out roads flooded cities. It flooded pretty extensively the towns of Salton Sea Beach, Desert Shores, and Bombay Beach, and touched on some other areas. Just flooded out all the resorts, clear up to the Yacht Club. After Kathleen, we had uh, a big one in 78, 79, 81, and 83. And there were others in between, but these were ones that were notable, uh, possibly like 100 to 300 year storms. That caught a lot of people off guard because uh, basically in a desert area, many people here, especially with second homes, uh, felt, well, it's a desert. We don't have to worry too much about this. No flood insurance, don't worry about a thing. And then all of a sudden we have these big events coming up. So certainly a lot of people were, were caught off guard. I was caught off guard. And then what happened was, between 1980 and 1983. The Imperial Irrigation District, they said, okay, this is a new system. This is the base year. You order as much water as you want to. We'll deliver it. But you can't ever order more again. 
they were trying to protect their water rights. So the farmers, not knowing what they're going to grow or how much more acreage they're going to have, completely and way over ordered. And they took delivery. They didn't use it. Delivery is just coming through the canals. And where does it go? Into the lake. The lake rose 12 feet in three years. Many people, because of the rise in the water at the time, many people ended up abandoning their properties. And that's the time frame where you see a lot of the flood remnants now of, of the abandoned uh, trailer parks and the abandoned buildings that were flooded in, the, in that time frame. Bombay Beach had to build a levee around it. We lost two and a half blocks of properties. You can see the detritus and, and the, the sediment because this actually, before the, the lake rose, is probably about 10 feet lower where people lived, right here than where it is now. That's, that's just the sediment that got washed up. I'm sure that was a reason for them to think, well, man, I need to leave Dodge because we could have another hurricane. The farmers could continue to put too much water in the sea, and then the sea would continue to rise. And so people, they started leaving. That's probably what was the death knell, I guess, for the recreation in the valley. Then they said things were polluted. I'm thinking it was around 1985, the local health department kind of went overboard. They said, well, the, the fish had selenium in it, and they weren't good to eat. They went out and caught three fish and tested them, and at the federal level was five parts per billion. They, they found they were like six or seven parts per billion, and just a hair above the federal standards level. And so they came up with the rules and regulations that pregnant women couldn't eat the fish in the sea and you shouldn't eat more than four ounces a week and all kinds of rules and it they posted signs all over and they scared everybody off the fishermen quit coming the whole fishing industry crashed nobody came to the area anymore my neighbor said it smells down there my neighbor said uh, the water's dirty my neighbor said this my neighbor said that i mean there were different stories that weren't really true and people just sort of backed away from the sea I think mostly it's the bad publicity that, that, that this place gets. One of the biggest factors in success for a shoreline community is knowing where that shore is going to be. If you buy a house on the beach, you want to make sure the beach isn't going to come up and flood your house or be so far away that you live on a desert that was once near the beach. We're currently in the Desert Shores Canals, or the Keys as they're called, and it's a, a nicer area of the west shores of the Salton Sea where some custom homes were built along canals. And it's gone downhill quite a bit over the last couple years with the different water level. As you see, we just hit the bottom in the middle of these canals, and this water level should be six to 10 feet higher. So a lot of people, they have their life savings and they purchased a house next to something that has become quite possibly very detrimental for their health. In the last couple years, I've seen this water be green, brown, orange, yellow, red, depending on the type of salt-loving bacteria that are flourishing here at the moment. My sister and I were a year and a half apart. We felt like we were twins. Um, we dressed up the same. We did everything together. You know, she was my best friend. I was her best friend. So we always found a way to, like, stick together. Asthma, it was always there. I always had to carry an inhaler with me. So for me, it was normal. My sister Marie was diagnosed at 12 years old. For Marie, it was still very new. So she didn't get as many asthma attacks as I did, but I still didn't let it affect my life. We were at a birthday party and all of a sudden I stopped breathing. I had a lot of pain and I remember my mom was like, this is not normal. Let's take you to the emergency room. 
they took me to Eisenhower, and there they told you, you know what, she has a very, very severe pneumonia. She's gonna have to stay here. I was there for over a month. We went to the doctor. He's like, you know what, you might wanna start thinking about getting a lung transplant. And that was when I was 12. That was the first time I ever heard of a lung transplant. It's tragic. And it's going to be more or less a disaster in the not too distant future for selfish, selfish money. Money, it's all about money. The Imperial Irrigation District, they have significant amounts of control over the resources here, as well as what happens with political activities and restoration initiatives. In 2003, the Southwestern states and the water companies got together to discuss and sign the Quantification Settlement Agreement, or the QSA. IID, which got in the early 20s, 70% of California's Colorado River allocation of fresh water was forced to share with San Diego and Los Angeles. So this was the largest ag to urban water transfer the country had ever seen and it gave the region a 15-year time limit to develop restoration and mitigation initiatives that would make sure that the Salton Sea wouldn't become a disaster and that the quality of life generally in the region would be able to still thrive while transferring more of the inflows to the coast. Basically what they did was they started paying farmers not to grow. They're following, they're stopping the water use in some of the lands. And the ones that still were producing, they pushed towards really efficient water conservation, which is a good thing, except there's no water going into the lake. It's been fed by irrigation runoff for over 100 years. The sea started going down fairly rapidly. Back in 2003, they realized that becoming more efficient meant less water goes to the Salton Sea, which means the Salton Sea shrinks. but there was a lot of pressure to get the deal signed rapidly, but they didn't know how to address all these broader challenges, so they essentially kicked the can down the road. That was the state's agreement to say, we don't know what we're gonna do right now, so we're gonna give ourselves 15 years to come up with a plan. But now, that time's run out, and there's still no real plan. 2003 to 2007 or eight, the sea went down about a half a foot a year, and a tremendous drop. That's when things kind of turned around, and my sister Marie was the one that was getting really, really sick. You know, just so many asthma attacks here and there, and it was just, we were wondering, like, what's going on, you know? Those areas that were covered with salt water became emissive. For those that are prone to asthma, it was bad. Back in 2007, the state of California came up with a plan, what they called the preferred alternative, to fix the Salton Sea. That came with a price tag of about $9 billion. Unfortunately, the time was extraordinarily bad because shortly thereafter, California and the nation fell into the, the Great Recession, and there simply wasn't money available. But even if there were money available, it wasn't clear that there was a political will to appropriate the amount of money required to take action at the Salton Sea. So the trade-off then seemed to be, we can spend all this money to do something at the Salton Sea, or we spend nothing. It's either $9 billion or zero, and seems like zero was the preferred course of action for the legislature and many of the people, certainly in Sacramento. We're working on a project in Desert Shores and the West Shores, a small project to put water back into a community that is dried out, a canal community. This is the only citizen-led project to do restoration along the shoreline at the Salton Sea, and it's taken about three years to get to this point. What our canals need most is water and a sustainable water level. So the goal of the project is to put a berm, a small dam, right where we're standing, and pump water from the main body of the sea into the canals. Phase one of this project would be to build the berm and put water in there and keep it there. A second phase would be to improve the water quality by taking the salts out, taking the nutrients out, and bringing it back to ocean quality salinity uh, for habitat, for fish, birds, and recreation as well. We're ready to lay the berm. We have a lot of materials donated. We could build this in two days, but it's been two and a half years of paperwork with different agencies, and they're playing some sort of stall tactic on it. It's hard to point the fingers at any one entity in particular, 
but everything is on stall on purpose at this moment. This is my sister, Marie. Senior year hits, right? You know what, Marie, I'm, I'm planning to move out. And she's like, oh, well, as soon as I get to leave, you know, I'm gonna move with you. And it's like, yeah, you know, we'll get a place together. I was gonna head off to do uh, my college orientation. And we started traveling, so it was just me, my mom, and my brother. And as soon as we actually hit the Salton Sea, which is ironic, we got a call saying, you know what, Marie just had a severe asthma attack. She's being transported to the emergency room. You need to, you know, come down. My mom dropped us off here, and then Marie's boyfriend called me around 11.30. And I still remember I was standing there, and he called, and he just, all he said was, Michelle, Marie is dead. And I kind of like, I kind of went back, looked at the TV, and I started thinking, well, like, why isn't the TV off? That's all I could think of, like, why didn't someone turn off the TV? And I was like, wait, what, what did you say? And he repeated again, like, Marie just passed away. So I remember I screamed. I, I dropped the phone. Um, we drove to Old Central, and, and I walked in, and, you know, there she was. And I think that was the hardest time it's ever, because she wasn't moving. Yeah, she was gone, and I didn't get to say bye to her. And, you know, it was really heartbreaking. We ended up finding now a little bit more after everything had kind of cooled down, um, and my mom got the actual reports of what happened. My sister Marie had her asthma attack. She used the inhaler, it didn't work, so she went straight to the nebulizer machine. The nebulizer machine didn't do anything for her. What it ended up doing was raising her heartbeat. With that, she ended up creating a lot of saliva, which eventually she choked on her own saliva while she was having an asthma attack. Something needs to be done really quick. They can't let it go like Owens Lake did when they dried that up and have all those problems there. We've seen that. We've seen what can happen. It is another Owens Lake. Very similar situation. The difference is the Salton Sea is larger. So Owens Lake uh, used to be a full lake before the LA Department of Water and Power diverted uh, some of its tributaries to help supply the, the growth of LA and the San Fernando Valley. Since all that water was taken away many years ago. The air quality in the Owens Lake area has become a major costly issue trying to mitigate that air pollution. And the prediction is that that's going to happen at the Salton Sea only on a larger scale. Owens Dry Lake then became the largest source of uh, dust pollution in the nation. It led to a lot of litigation and ultimately a settlement where the water supplier, LA, uh, Department of Water and Power, went back to Owens Lake and started spending uh, more than $2 billion now, I believe to address that dust problem. So the, the scale of the Salton Sea is, is, could be as much as four or five times as much uh, exposed lake bed as we see as uh, the dust emitting area at, at Owens Lake. So it could be even a larger problem. When this dust became a major issue in Owens Lake in Central California, people would have to be evacuated out of the valley. The teams working on the mitigation issues there would have to leave. The towns went down the tubes. The property values plummeted. They lost their tourism. People got sick. It's a lesson from history that we don't have to repeat. There was a study that was done by the Pacific Institute, and they looked at what they called the cost of inaction, basically the social and economic costs of doing nothing, of the status quo at the Salton Sea. I started to dive into this a little deeper and said, well, what's actually the actual cost of not taking action at the Salton Sea? And I started looking at some previous studies and estimating some of these costs. That organization came up with an estimate of between 29 and $70 billion over the next 30 years. So the trade-off is not $9 billion for doing something versus zero. The trade-off was $9 billion for doing something versus 29 or as much as $70 billion for not taking action at the Salton Sea. And the problem is that people that would pay those costs uh, at the state level 
were not the people that would bear those costs in the Salton Sea region. If the Salton Sea were right next to LA or right next to San Francisco or Sacramento, we would have solved this problem a long time ago. We're not supported by congressmen or state senators. Our congressman represents San Diego. How is he gonna help us when the people in San Diego are thirsty? We live in the area. It's our lives that are at stake. The people that make all these decisions do not live in the area. So they aren't, they aren't vested. Two years ago, I had the chance to stop by every state senator and assembly person's office in one day in Sacramento. And about a third of their staff didn't know the largest lake in the state existed. This area has a large Hispanic demographic, and there's been some challenges in bridging the gap between the governmental meetings that are mostly held in English and many of the people that live here that just aren't being represented. It makes me feel angry. For us to go through Marie's death, you know, that was a lot of pain. We went through a lot of pain. And then even after several kids passed away, and I kept thinking, like, why? Why isn't anybody doing anything? Why isn't anybody seeing that we're real people with real feelings and we're going through a lot of pain? It is a real deterioration that is progressing and is expected to get worse. The water transfers are accelerating the decline of the Salton Sea. And when the full quantification agreement kicked in, is when I really, really noticed the decline. It was dramatic. So this is a ramp up in the amount of water being transferred. And starting January 1st, 2018, this amount of water went up exponentially and the sea level is declining very rapidly. We're in the North Shore area, North Shore of the Salton Sea. This is where Frank Sinatra and all the uh, celebrities hung out. Since the full act kicked in, with the cutoff of water uh, from the water districts and the transfers to San Diego and so on, the water appears to be at least 50 feet further out, and it will get significantly worse. Respectfully to our dear government, none of their predictions were accurate. Uh, the decline of water was usually two or three times faster than they said it was. If they said it was inches, it would be feet. As a lake recedes, it's shallower and it's warmer, and it will evaporate faster. So it's going to go from falling by about a half a foot per year to about a foot and a half per year, which could expose as much as 100 square miles of Salton Sea lake bed in the next 15 years or so. The Salton Sea is a terminal lake. Water flows in, but the only way water gets out of the Salton Sea is through evaporation. But as the water itself evaporates, all the salts are left behind in the Salton Sea. So it's now approaching twice as salty as the ocean, which means that the fish that normally survive in ocean water are extremely stressed or can't reproduce or can't survive at all. People started to notice that there weren't that many fish and there were several fish die-offs. It's usually not a toxin or anything like that. The fish kills are primarily caused by, believe it or not, low temperatures. Uh, tilapia is a tropical fish. So in the winter, when we get temperatures here in the mid 30s or even low 40s, we'll get a fish kill because of that, because the dissolved oxygen is so low, the fish are barely hanging on. Just that little bit of temperature change pushes them over the edge. I haven't seen an actual line caught fish in at least two or three years. The birds that used to eat those fish are becoming increasingly stressed because there's not the food that they used to rely on. Back in the 90s, there were more than a million birds on the surface of the Salton Sea at once. The bird population in the last two or three years is down 80% right now. There's nothing. And this is, this is the time of year for them to be here. Typically at this time of year, you could look out here and see hundreds, maybe thousands of birds all up and down the shoreline, uh, pelicans, seagulls, and egrets, and a, a number of others. Now, uh, as we see, almost down to nothing. The sea is going to continue to shrink. It's going to continue to get more salty. The ramifications of inaction are that we're going to have about 65,000 acres of playa exposed. That exposed lake bed would be subject to the whims of nature, and especially the wind. The Salton Sea essentially has collected over the past 110 years various trace contaminants. As the Salton Sea shrinks, 
and that sediment's exposed, there's concern that some of those contaminants are going to be breathed in by people. Particulate matter 10 and particulate matter 2.5. It's dust, it's silt. Uh, PM10, when you breathe it, it shreds, shreds your lung cells. And PM2.5 infiltrates into your bloodstream through your lung cells. The air quality has gotten worse. There's no question about it. Um, unfortunately, because we're not doing anything about the salt and sea, it's just dying out. There's a lot of winds that are starting to pick up and it just brings everything in here. We are only about 30 minutes away from the Salton Sea. So anytime there's a wind, that wind's gonna pick up whatever's at the Salton Sea and it brings it this way. Obviously when that happens and we see that it's windy outside, I already know, hey, I gotta have my mask ready, which I have masks on hand. So you definitely sense it, you feel it. I think just yesterday we were passing the Salton Sea, I get a small asthma attack. So I was like, okay, I'll control it. I, you know, use my inhaler, controlled it. And we passed by maybe like 10, 15 minutes after that, I kind of cooled down. So yeah, it's noticeable. There's just no doubt about it. They can see the impacts just from emergency room visits in the area. So it's imperative that we move now to do some kind of mitigation for those exposed playa areas. Between 2009 and 2018, there have been hundreds of proposals that have gone before our representatives and our political leaders, and very little has actually been done. The state has developed a 10-year plan of restoration, but even if the 10-year plan is completely funded, which it is not, and completely built out, there will be tens of thousands of additional acres exposed in between this period. The state is uh, way behind on their progression in the 10-year plan and it is a Band-Aid on a mortal wound. It's not gonna keep up with the exposed playa. Currently, I believe the 10-year plan has only covered about 27 acres. In the first couple years, their goal was thousands. So we are already far behind. How are we already not achieving our goals with the state? So compared to the large-scale restoration that had been agreed upon in 2008 and 2009, $9 billion, we have 3% of that funding. The amount of money that the state of California has set aside for restoration at the Salton Sea is an absolute joke. This area of Keys or canals has virtually dry canals. There's a little bit of water. Um, as you can see, the water levels dropped close to 20 feet. You can still see the tilapia nest because this was, until just a couple years ago, excellent fish and bird habitat. And if we're able to bring this water level back up, um, it can be again. We're starting to see the bottom of these channels just this summer, and the water's turning red, and we're losing the birds, and this seems to be happening over and over, unfortunately. The thing is, we know how to fix this spot, and it's wholly supported by all of these residents. In spite of our health issues, which are dire and getting worse, there is no sense of urgency on any level with the state. They're just dragging their feet, it's, it's just, a, it's, it's something they can put out there to say, look, we're doing something, except they're not. News Channel 3's Jeremy Chen has more on the state's focus to deal with the exposed lake bed that everyone seems to agree will be an environmental disaster if it's not managed as the Salton Sea gets smaller and smaller. A total of $700 million has been allocated to restore the Salton Sea, mostly from state sources, but about $500 million remains unspent as the state missed its goal of restoring 500 acres of wetlands by the end of 2018. The state has come up with very little money and has been far behind for decades. So what's happening now is the state, they're trying to develop a crust, a salt crust, and some vegetation that will grow in that to keep the dust down so people don't like die of respiratory disease lots of people. This is the crust they're trying to preserve. This is actually a whole ecosystem of, of symbiotic organisms, fungi and, and bacteria, and actually some like dry algae. So right now I have this fungus. It's, it's a fungus that's inside my lungs. Uh, it's called aspergillolysis, which pretty much is 
a mold that grows, you breathe it in, it takes over a year to get rid of this. I had two hospitalizations since then, and they've been trying to get rid of it. It's just, it's not budging, it's still there. And like my doctors had said, in the location you're in, it's gonna be really hard for you to get rid of it because you have the salt and sea, which is blowing air your way with all that stuff in there. And you're just gonna keep getting sick. They're trying to figure out what to do, but the issues is that my lungs have taken so much damage over the years that they look like that of an 80 year old. So what they have said to me, if you think about it, your lungs are 80. In 20 years, they'll be 100. You might wanna start thinking about a lung transplant. So yeah, it's really scary. In order for us to continue to live here, we're gonna to have to find solutions to solve the dust issue. If it is allowed to dry up, it will change all of our lifestyles. We will probably have to give up the ship and move someplace else because we will not be able to live here. I ask myself this question every day, why don't I just move? It might be easier for me. Obviously, it'll be easier for my kids but it's a lot harder than that. So imagine going to a different state. I'll have no one there. I'll have no family. I would have to look into new schools for my kids. The income, the money. I mean, we don't have the money to just grab our things and move. So yeah, it's easy to ask the question, why not just move? But to actually do it, it's a lot more difficult. I mean, my life is here. We have our Earth Day event here every year. It brings hundreds of people out to come and work on salt and sea restoration initiatives. Most of our work with the Save Our Sea campaign has been large public events, bringing the community together with science, uh, with political leaders. So don't get us wrong. We are very grateful for the efforts that the state has put in. We're grateful for the individuals that have been a part of this and that have been supportive of this, but it simply isn't enough. And no one can say in their right mind that it has been enough. Right. We need to convince our local agencies that this is a start. Once, once this moves, once this starts moving, once water is in here, it's the first citizen organized restoration project at the largest lake in the state of California. We are making history here, but we need your help to continue this. If you would like to be a part of the community cleanup, please head this way. We're gonna send a team out to the beach. The community has gotten really organized along with a few of our volunteer groups to refill these canals. So this is currently April 2019. It has been picked up by the state of California as one of the projects on their list, and they agreed to fund the project, build the berm, build the pump systems, and help these people. According to the state of California's representatives working on the 10-year plan for the Salton Sea, this should be completed by the end of this year. Judged by their past track record, I'm not sure if this is gonna happen in that time frame at all, but I'm gonna do everything that I can to help that along. Get this stuff going. Yeah, there we go. This is Poseidon. This is our pumping barge, funded entirely out of pocket. This boat is to be a mobile pump device that can pull up to the drying canal communities and refill them. We wanted to build a tool that they can use. Huge military-grade pump, Lotus car motor, and we can launch this and move it up and down the shores. It is actually far more than the state of California has done for these residents. This is the first step that can actually quickly bring the water up in any of the canal communities. California is idly standing by and allocating very few resources to a massive environmental disaster. You know, in the private sector, we could take about ten to twenty thousand dollars and go build that berm and be done. Poseidon would fill it up, and that would be the end of that story. But because the state's involved, it has to be so complicated. Well, it's just practically impossible. The the state is just trying to kick the can down the road until the feds come in and fix it because they're going to have to. The community here is scared and frustrated because the resources that we need to thrive and be healthy just simply aren't coming. Selfish, selfish groups of different people not doing the right thing. That's, that's what kills me. 
we still have an opportunity to take positive action in the Solon Sea. One of the challenges with the Solon Sea is the sheer scale of it. It's such a massive body of water, about 370 square miles, a huge body of water. So it's hard to grasp how big that really is. When I first moved here in 1973, the newspaper had a big headline, Plan Devised to Save the Salton Sea. This was in 1973. I mean, it's like every month or two, there's a new plan. Oh, now we're going to do this. Now we're going to do that. And it, it, it's like fatigue <laughs> looking at all these different plans. It's like, well, wait a minute. I thought you were going to do the dike across it. No, now we're going to do this. No, now we're going to do different ponds. Now we're going to do eight different ponds. This seems to change about every two months. Uh, nothing seems to be standard. We need a huge influx of water here. Uh, salinity is getting too high, and we need to raise, raise the level. And uh, we need something to stabilize it. And uh, if it keeps going down, salinity will be so high, it will just kill everything. The Southwest is developing so fast. We need water. That water is going everywhere else but the Salton Sea now. We're completely out of fresh water to put into the Salton Sea. We're, we're not going to be able to get any more of that. Our coastal cities are getting thirstier. All of the cities up the Colorado River are going to continue growing. So the only way to maintain a large Salton Sea is to import water from the ocean. Since 10 million years ago, this was part of the Gulf of California. Why don't we just build a canal or a pipeline from the Gulf of California back to here? Often we hear people talk about bringing in water from the Gulf of California. So you could do it. People have built the Suez Canal, the Panama Canal, but that's the magnitude of the investment that would be required. Luckily, we're 230 feet below sea level, and this can be done gravity fed without pumps. You can create a channel with a series of locks that keep water gravity fed however much you want, however much you need for as long as you'd like. Super, super simple solution. It's all downhill. That's not going to cost $9 billion. It's a ditch. The Save Our Sea campaign and our volunteers led many trips into Mexico showcasing the possibility of how to import water from the ocean. Laguna Salada. The northern tip of Laguna Salada is about 15 or 20 miles from the border and the new river, which flows directly downhill into the Salton Sea. How hard is that? I could take a pickaxe and a shovel and do it right now. It would take me a summer or two. There is a very feasible option to add water to restore the Salton Sea and bring back so many of the benefits that we would lose with its drying. It's happening in the Middle East. They're currently doing something very similar from the Red Sea to the Dead Sea. We have the option to desalinate water. We have geothermal resources that can power desalination completely renewably and this can provide clean water for the entire Southwest. There are amazing things that can be done when we do this the right way. It makes the most sense to systematically develop the resources that are unique to the Salton Sea. And we think that the best way to get at a bona fide restoration model is to develop the renewable energy that is found only there. Just judging by the history in California, for the price of mitigating a sixth of the Salton Sea and creating very little habitat, we could import water from the ocean, cover all of the dust we need to, start desal programs, start having all the water we need for however much habitat we want, up our tourism, improve our relations with Mexico, dramatically help the tribes south of the border, and build something that people want to believe in and would invest in. The only thing that's going to work for sure is if we get a, a connection uh, through the Sea of Cortez. People would buy property here again. People would be safe to do so if there's enough water to work with. If we don't secure a new source of water, in a few years, this would be out miles. Every shoreline community is at extreme risk here. These people deserve to have their quality of life and health maintained. This is a place worth saving. A lot of people think, well, it's just a local problem. It's not just a local problem. It's something that can affect a good part of California, all over California and, and beyond, with the dust, the things that are underneath the salt and sea. Makes me angry. There's no reason for this. The clock is ticking on this ecological disaster. It's time to get moving. We need to see a genuine sense of urgency to move forward on sea to sea. That is the one single project that has the greatest 
possibility of saving the sea and the surrounding area. The only salvation would be a canal from the Sea of Cortez or the Gulf of California straight into the Salton Sea. You know, it goes on for a little bit. It's the talk of the day. And then the next day you get something new and that gets forgotten. That's the issue here is that we talk about it for so little that people forget about it. Like, oh, that's really sad. Oh, but look at what happened over here. And it's like, that should not be the case. We should be talking about it every single day until something gets done. People are getting sicker and sicker. This goes from Mexicali, just south of the border, all the way up into um, Coachella, Palm Springs, Indian Wells, Riverside, Los Angeles. It can affect the people in Orange County, San Diego, even all the way into Yuma, Arizona. And not stepping up is putting all of these people's health at risk. It's a creeping environmental problem, which means that it's just slowly changing at the Salton Sea. And we can see those changes now but it's a, essentially a gradual uh, accumulation of impacts. It's not like a forest fire or an earthquake or a freeway collapse where we can say, here's the problem, we have to solve this now. Uh, we're gonna go back to the Salton Sea next year and five years and say, well, this is much worse than it used to be. We should have done something five years ago. But it's not that immediate crisis that people seem to respond to quickly. It scares me because I have two kids. My kids are, you know, three and six. I mean, I just want things to get better, but obviously that won't happen until we see some change. The most important thing we can do to be a part of the success and restoration at the Salton Sea is to come to the table, to be a part of these conversations that are affecting our lives, to be going to the meetings that are making the choices for the region, whether it be in Sacramento, if you can make it, or at our local water boards, at our local water agencies, and you need to speak up for the solutions and successes that you believe will be good for your families. We can do this. We need to contact our representatives, our assembly people, our senators, and provide constructive feedback on the actions that are being taken. If they're doing something wrong or corrupt, call them out. If they're doing something right, offer to help. But we can't expect that someone is going to fix this for us. We're all a part of the solution, whether we like it or not. The Salton Sea is a very mysterious and confounding place. Well, it's very unusual. There are few places in the world like this. In a way, it's a forlorn place, but it also has a real beauty to it. People call it an accidental lake, but it's also the largest lake in California. And something needs to be done about the impacts to air. Everything changes. It won't be exactly what it was. That's history. Yeah, it's, it's sad to see the sea change, but it's always changing, and it'll always continue to change. We would like to see this return to what it was in the 60s, and we can do better now. We'll add enough infrastructure where people want to stay, want to live here. We can have a thriving economy, not just a vacation point in the future. I still have hope for it. It is a beautiful area. Now, if we can show people how special it is there, I think it has possibilities. It can come back. I ask all those who haven't been here, who have the power to make the right decisions, to spend some time in the area, see a sunset, and then the sea will do the rest. The sea is the best one to do the talking of why to get involved, why it matters.